Welcome to Mountain Strong. Today we have come to Flat Top Mountain. Flat Top Mountain is probably the most popular hike in the city of Anchorage. You can basically reach the trailhead of Flat Top Mountain at the Glen Alps uh, parking lot. Basically reach that from about 30 minutes anywhere in uh, at least South Anchorage, maybe just a little bit further if you're in the northern part of Anchorage. You come up to the Glen Alps parking lot, you have a walk over what's called Blueberry Hill, and uh, then after coming around Blueberry Hill, you uh, start your ascent up a series of stairs, and then after those stairs comes a scramble of a pretty steep uh, face, and then you're at the top of Flat Top. It's kind of like a rite of passage here in Anchorage. Everybody's got to do it at least once, and uh, for some of us, we've done it a lot more than that, and for others, uh, they do it every day. I know a, a man who he does it basically every single day and uh, comes up here and he climbs up, but then he doesn't climb down. He actually jumps off in a, in a parachute. And if you are uh, lucky, you can see some of those parachuters around the place. I, I saw a couple on the way up, but wasn't able to catch them on video. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're gonna be having a look together for our first Psalm at Psalm 73 from up here. So let's go ahead and read that now. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus... I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by tears. Like a dream when one wakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge, that I may tell all of your works. It's worth noting, though we won't cover the same ground over again, that Psalm 73 is virtually the exact opposite of Psalm 37. If you remember when we studied Psalm 37, you know the psalmist there presents the idea of putting riches or wealth into perspective. But here, the writer of this psalm seems to have lost that perspective. He seems to be approaching the idea of wealth from a position of envy, from a position where he views those who are on the other side of the life of faith, those who are against God, and, uh, and he's really troubled by that prospect. He's writing, though, from a place where he has come through that and reflecting upon that time in his life when he was envious of those who were prosperous. And he describes that in the first couple of verses. Notice how he says, my feet nearly slipped. And they slipped from what? They slipped from God's path? Well, they did, but first they slipped from seeing God's goodness. And I think really that's oftentimes the way it works. You fail to see God's goodness, and then you slip from his path. And so he's saying, I, I really was about to give up on my God. Now, why was it? Well, it was because of envy. It was because of envy based upon the prosperity of the wicked. Now, when you're thinking about that from a Bible believer standpoint, you're saying, well, that's pretty ironic. The fact that he is envious of the wicked, because when he is envious of the wicked, he has placed himself truly among the wicked. You remember how Jesus said in Mark chapter 7 and verse 22 that envy proceeds from the heart and defiles us? 
And that's possibly why in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, when Paul thought of envy, he thought about it as a work of the flesh. You don't have to go very far in the New Testament before you're going to start seeing some condemnation of the concept of envy. Now, why is envy such a problem? Why is it so dangerous? And why did it cause the psalmist to, to nearly slip? Well, because when we look at things enviously, when we look at people enviously, when we say that they have it better than me, those people in the world, they have it better than me, when we start viewing things like that, we start moving ourselves away from the sphere of reality into a a false reality, a, a lie. You notice how he says in verses 4 through 12, just to kind of characterize those words, in verse 12 he says that these wicked people are always at ease. And notice how how general his his tone has become. Everybody's like this, he says. All of them are enjoying good. They're always at ease. And as for him, he says, I have been rebuked every morning, all the day long. And so he's looking at this and he's thinking about it from the standpoint of absolutes. I think that if he were looking at this from the standpoint of faith, if he were truly taking stock of his life, he might find that there were moments of difficulty in his life, but he would find that there was a whole lot of good. And if he were truly looking at the other side properly, then he would see the same as well, that even though there might be some things that seem to be good about them, there's a lot that's going wrong, and that's kind of the point. But if we are tempted to view things enviously, or really we already are viewing them enviously, how can we come back from there? How can we avoid stumbling or falling away? Well, notice how he moves from talking about them to talking about himself. In verses 13 and 14, he thinks the life of faith is in vain. Uh, He wants to express his doubts, but he stops for a second, and it's powerful that he does so. He doesn't express his doubts because he knows the impact that having those doubts in front of his fellow believers would have on them. And that causes him to think already differently about what he's doing and how he's viewing things. He says, I would destroy people if I expressed these thoughts out loud. Maybe I need to start thinking about this a little bit more carefully. He doesn't know where to go, how to move forward. He says, when I thought this, it seemed like a wearisome task. How am I going to to come back from here? I'm going to correct myself. But then he did something very important. He went into the sanctuary. He went into the assembly. He went into the worship of God. He approached God's throne. And when he started viewing things from the throne of God, from the, the holy place of God, his sanctuary, when he started viewing things from that place, as opposed to the false reality he had allowed himself to step into through envy, That's when things became clear, and he began to see things as he ought to see them. It's incredibly important that we assemble with God's people. When we forsake the assembly, not only are we setting aside passages of Scripture like Hebrews 10.25 and and the, the corollaries of that text in Hebrews that encourage us to encourage one another daily and to encourage one another to good works, provoke one another to good works, and so on. We, we, we set those things aside, of course, but we're also setting aside something truly precious for us. We benefit from the assembly. It's in the assembly that for once in our week, or maybe if you're blessed to be in a place that meets more than once, twice, three times, more than that, every time you assemble with God's people, you're being given a glimpse of what is real and what is true. And every time you enter into the world, you're being flooded with lies. The assembly is where things take perspective, where things take shape for being what they are. And from the standpoint of the assembly, from the standpoint of the sanctuary, of the place of worship, he looks at this and he says, well, you know, God is going to deal vengeance on these people in verses 18 through 20. And verses 21 through 26, he says that I have what they do not. I have something far more precious. And he looks at this and he says, I was brutish. I was arrogant. Verse 22, I was, I was not looking at this properly. And God guided him back to a proper frame of mind. But again, where did that happen? It happened in the assembly. There is something that I want to point out in this psalm that's lost in our translations, at least most of them, and that is the false idea that is presented as real in the course of the psalm. In verse 1, he says that truly God is good. Truly God is good. Well, though most versions translate it out, there is actually another occurrence of the word truly in verse 13. Verse 13, if we would translate it properly, would say truly in vain. Have I kept my heart clean? Was that true? No. But what caused him to believe the lie? Once again, it was when he was envious. It was only when he looked at things from the standpoint of worship, from the standpoint of God's throne, that he began to view things as they truly were. And that's why in verse 18 you find him returning to what is really true and saying truly once again. 
Envy not only separates me from my God, but it places me amongst the wicked people that I might be envying at those times. I don't want to be guilty of envy, and I certainly want to learn the main lesson of this psalm, the assembly of God's people, the sanctuary of God's people. And I'm not talking about a building or a place necessarily, but when God's people assemble together, when the temple of God forms to worship Him, it is in that place that we can come to find perspective and we can come to find learning. The assembly is a place of learning. It's a place where we find what is real and what is false. And so I hope all these encouragements are encouraging to you. I hope that when you're tempted to envy others, that you might go back to church, that you might listen to what is taught, that you might uh, perhaps request the song farther along, and perhaps you might see that we will understand why our God is doing what He is doing, and we will see that He will ultimately bring justice upon this earth. May God bless you today, and may God bless all of us as we strive to avoid being envious.